I decided that we would go through a little bit of the bee anatomy prior to going through the life cycle. And the reason for that is some of the diseases and problems that come about later on. Uh, you don't have to memorize any of this for sure, but you'll hear terms and this kind of gives you an idea of what they are, okay? And that's just a uh, picture I pulled out of a out of a book. I'm not real good at this, so okay. Uh, and I wanted to just give a special thanks to Dr. Kilmer. Uh, a lot of these slides came from her. In fact, the vast majority. Uh, she taught uh, last spring semester. She taught a class on. Uh, Let's see, bees and other pollinators, honeybees and other pollinators, something along those lines, okay? And uh, this was in some of her, these came from some of her presentation in classes. Uh, bees belong to the uh, class called Insecta. Uh, as with most in, uh, insects, they're an exoskeleton, means they're a skeleton different than ours, they wear theirs on the outside. And they have three distinct body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Uh, three pairs of legs, two pair of wings, and one pair of antenna on the head. So this is kind of what describes uh, the honeybee, or well, actually it should be the insect class. Uh, the honeybee belongs to the order of Hymenoptera. You don't have to remember how to pronounce that. It has taken me over a year to be able to pronounce that. Uh, and basically it means that they have members or see-through wings, uh, chewing parts, uh, large compound eyes. Uh, wasps are also a member of Hymenoptera. And bees and wasps. Yep. And then they're in the, the sub-order of, uh, I believe it's Apocrypta, which means they just have a small waist, okay? They're the Dolly Partons of the, of the insect world. Uh, <clears throat> with the exoskeletons made up of three layers of cuticle, and this is where the body hairs attach. Most of us don't think these, I never knew or never thought the bees had hair, but they do. So, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, outer shell, it's, uh, uh, it does not grow, so it has to be shed during molting, and with honeybees, that takes place all inside when they're uh, a pupa in the honeycomb. As they grow in there, they actually shed uh, their exoskeleton. Okay, look at the head. It's made up of the compound eye. I read somewhere that each the compound eye or is just a, one lens made up of about 14,000 lenses on each side. Uh, there are three eyes up on the top of the head called the bacillus. Uh, those, they believe, are used for their homing uh, GPS, if you want to, <laughs> so how they navigate. Uh, and they see into the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, so uh, they don't, you go plant flowers in your garden, and we all think, oh, we want red flowers. Bees can't see red. It looks black to them. So red does not and attract them. I see red. It looks like they see red on the mm -hmm. Isn't that red on the end? That's the yellow? <clears throat> this is red red. This is the high end of the red. Well, it's all the same color. Yeah. No. no it's, 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 it, this is a more of a yellow going kind of 
with an orange or something. Yeah, they look the same. But if, if, if your if your cataracts are not cloudy, that's that's more <laughs> it orange. It is not my cataracts. <laughs> it, I really am tone blind. Okay. Now what do, what bees do see, and this is just a comparison between what we see and what the bees see. So they see down here in the ultraviolet okay. that we don't see. Okay. Um, and this is the, the ocellus up here, the, there it is, and then the, got the mouth parts, uh, like I said, the ocellus directs uh, sunlight, helps in navigation, and the antenna uh, contains receptors for touch, taste, smell, and they can be used to be to detect humidity, carbon dioxide, gravity, vibrations, wind speed. So, and the uh, carbon dioxide right here, that's what we all exhale. So, a lot of times the bees will come right up to your face, it's because of the carbon dioxide. Okay? So they, they breathe in carbon dioxide or they breathe in? No, they ex they. <clears throat> they, they're just like us, they exhale, if you will, carbon dioxide, inhale oxygen. Uh, it's a little bit different than what we do, but they can sense the carbon dioxide. And that's just because typically it's a mammal that is going to be into their hive, looking to rob it out, and I don't care if you're uh, four-legged or two-legged skunk, you know, they treat you the same. A bear. That's why we don't wear black. So the carbon dioxide, they come to your face because they think you're going to attack them, so they're going well, to attack you back. Yeah, it's 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 if you believe in if you believe in evolution, which I don't, mm -hmm. but if you believe in that, then they say, well, this is something over evolution, the predators for the hive typically are mammals, and they have learned that this is a sensitive area, okay? Mm. So, That's I just think they were designed that way <laughs> from the beginning, so. Uh, they have the feeding appendages, we've got the uh, mandibles, and they differ a little bit between the cast of the bees. Uh, we've got the proboscis. Why do they have big names for them? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and so, and that's what, the that's what they used to suck up. That's what they used to suck up the nectar from the uh, uh, from the flowers. Uh, and the proboscis is soft. It can be extended or retracted. And then the thorax, the middle part, has all the locomotive appendages. It has the three pairs of jointed legs. Uh, the front legs are used to clean the antenna. I don't know, you've probably seen pictures where they'll have those front legs and they're kind of doing this kind of thing. That's cleaning for the antenna, probably even for the head. There will be pollen sometimes in the hairs on the head so they can clean that out too. Rear legs contain the pollen basket. That's where they store the pollen. We've all seen it like uh, right here on our bees. I make that assumption. I don't know how many of you have bees. I know some of you do. but uh, And you may have seen bees flying around and their hind legs have these orange or red or yellow, green or purple, whatever pollen they're after right at the time. Uh, and then they have the two uh, wing, sets of wings used for flight, also buzz pollination. Uh, we think of honeybees going in after the uh, uh, nectar with their tongue, but on, and in that process getting pollen on them. Some flowers, the buzz or the hum of the bees is enough to dislodge the pollen and it's attracted to their bodies. It probably sets up, sets up a little bit of a static charge so that the pollen, the small pollen granules are attracted to it. 
Okay. Now then, there are three casts of honeybees in the hive. We've got Her Majesty, the Queen, right here. We've got the worker, and then we've got the drone. <coughs> that guy. Do what? That, that, that. Oh, yeah. He's, he's basically on steroids. Uh, the queen has the longest body. As you can tell from here, it's kind of pointed, and there re there's a reason for that because she has to put her, her butt down in the uh, cell to lay an egg. Uh, tell everybody, and I, I was guilty, looking for a queen in the hive. The first 15 queens I found were drones. <laughs> because you look for something big, and the drone ain't big, and he stands right out. So, depending on the time of year, there's a lot of drones. Yeah, and sometimes there is, that's correct. Uh, this, uh, the abdomen com contains all the reproductive structures. The spermatosea, I think is how that's pronounced, yeah. that's where she stores the sperm from all the drones that she's made it with. And remember, she can mate with up to 20 drones. Uh, the ovaries mature in about two, one to two weeks of age, and then she lays continuously until her death. Uh, she, it's a figurehead only. She's, a, she's really a slave to the hive. They push her to lay eggs. They tell her where to lay eggs. She makes no decisions in the hive other than whether to lay a fertilized or non-fertilized egg. And that has to do with the size of the cell. She's important for hive unity. Do what? She's important for hive unity. Mm -hmm. Because they all have to know her pheromone to keep yeah. everybody united. Yeah. The queen has a stinger, but unlike the worker, it doesn't have a barb on it. So she can sting repeatedly and uh, early in the spring when you see swarming or even possibly uh, supersedure of the queen, the first queen out may go around and sting all the other queens before they've hatched to kill them. It, it, it's a one lady only. So, and I don't know that, uh, I know I've never been stung by the queen, she's not really about the only time that's going to happen is when she's killing off her competitors. Yes? How would she know which egg is fertile and which isn't when it's inside her? She has control over that. What she does, when she lays an egg, she can either uh, allow the sperm to be secreted with the egg or not. And what will do that is with these front legs, she can sense what the size of the cell is. A drone cell is what, three or four millimeters larger than a worker cell, and she can tell that. So she doesn't, the egg isn't fertilized until it goes into the cell and then she puts the sperm on it. Well, it's, as it leaves her body, the sperm is, is uh, released at the same time the egg is, yeah. or not, okay? Yeah. So the, the drone is not fertilized? Nope. <coughs> Nope. The, the way you determine sex in bees is the drone just has one set of sex alleles and the worker and the queen have two sets of sex alleles. It's, and that determines the gender. And then there's a whole other hour talk about that. <laughs> so. All the bees are, are, are female except for drones. Yeah. They're the only man there. Yeah, one, one set of chromosomes equals drone. Two sets of chromosomes equals a type of female bee. Uh, the drones have the widest body, as we can see here. Uh, they contain the male reproductive structure. Uh, it's a one-time use. After mating, it is ripped out and he dies. Yeah. The drones also have no stinger. These guys are pretty much for one purpose, other than one purpose, they're pretty much worthless. I hate to say that about the male. I do. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but uh, they, in fact, they're so they are so worthless. They do no work in the hive. 
They can't clean themselves. The worker bees a lot of times have to feed them. I mean, they single-minded, I guess. Oh, yes. And the drone in this hive does not mate with the queen in that hive. When the drones leave the hive, they will go to a, in a different direction than the queen when she goes out to mate. So, okay. So I probably got decided in this way, but why don't they mate with the ones that's in the hive? I mean, they're right there. Because <laughs> that was simply And, and it, it's. Oh, okay. Okay. I remember we had that class or talked about that. Class. Yeah. Uh, the brother and sister. It just. Uh, I, it, just like, it would be just like I'm thinking. I'm trying to think of a word, and I can't think of it. So it's it's the it, same it's reason like, you don't kiss your cousin. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's you, 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 you don't want you don't <laughs> yeah. want the inbreeding because a yeah. lot of undesirable <laughs> traits are, are recessive. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's the same with the bees. So if okay. if you get these recessive traits, then you'll have colonies that won't be able to function because of defects in them. Genetic structure. Because the queen is laying, the queen is, she's laying both male and female. So then if the, if the drones, she would be breeding with her right. son. That's it. Okay. Yeah, it does seem weird. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. I, it, I mean, it makes sense too. It kind of throws you off a little bit. Okay. And the worker bees have the smallest abdomen. Uh, they also have uh, four pair of wax producing scales on the underside. They secrete a liquefied ax that hardens when it's uh, exposed to the air. This is only young bees. Uh, the worker bee does have a barbed stinger, as any of us that have been stung are well aware of. And here again, it's torn away from the, from the bee and results in the death of a worker. So typically bees aren't out to sting you because it's a death sentence to them. They have to be, feel threatened. I should say that there's maybe some genetics that they aren't quite that way. Okay, let's take a look at some of the internal anatomy. The digestive system is uh, made up of the foregut right here, the midgut, and then the hindgut. And the reason that we, we're talking about this, we'll talk about the uh, uh, nosema is a viral disease, and it affects the midgut right here. It's not viral. It's fungal. It's bacterial. Fungal. Fungal, fungal. bacterial. It'll, but it, it, makes, it, it makes basic, it basically, it's like it gives but the, the bees disappear. I know, but it may pass on. But <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, foregut and the hindgut here and here is lined with cuticle, which basically, you know, that's what made up part of their uh, exoskeleton. So there's no absorption of nutrients in either of those sections. So what do they go? They have the purpose. Yeah, All the digestion is in is in the midgut. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the foregut is considered the mouth. Here's the esophagus, and you've probably heard people talk about the honey stomach. Uh, they call it something. They call it the crop, and then there's a small valve right here that prevents any nectar from going the rest of the way into the digestive system. There are enzymes that are secreted here that start the digestive process. Uh, the only time, uh, they say the only time is when they're, they're moving honey. Uh, have to realize, and we'll probably get into this a little bit on that uh, later, the foragers come out, they don't store the honey. What they do is they give it to some of the uh, house bees and they're younger 
so they essentially will regurgitate what they've got in their honey crop here and the house bees will then take it, it goes to their honey crop and then they take it to wherever they're storing it in the hive. And then the mid-gut, this is where all the uh, digestion and absorption of the nutrients take place. It's a permeable membrane. Uh, enter the circulatory system at this point. Uh, these tubes right here, malphasian tubes, they pull the uh, uh, waste from the circulatory system. They then uh, transport it back here to the uh, hindgut. And hindgut is the final. It includes the uh, small intestine. They have the, essentially, I've seen some where they call the foregut or the midgut large intestines. They're kind of different from us. We have a small intestine, we go to a large intestine. Theirs is just the opposite. Uh, and then the rectum over here absorbs as much as 90% of the waste, water from the waste, and returns it to the insect. So bees do not produce urine. Most of their waste is completely dry. Mm. And when it's not, that's when you probably have a problem. Uh, they have what's called an open circulatory system, different than you and I. This example uses a grasshopper and a worm. I, the clo we have a closed circulatory system. Okay, we have vessels that carry uh, the blood to all of our organs and throughout our body. In a honeybee, the hemolymph, or the blood, circulates freely through the body. It's just kind of floating down through. Okay. Uh, there are no vessels. Uh, it's interesting, the hemolymph does not carry any oxygen. Our blood carries oxygen. It does not end the honeybee. Has dorsal hearts right here, multiple hearts that pump the blood back up here to the head and then it will flow back here and then there are some some entrances here where the hemolymph or the blood is pulled back in and recirculated and so basically the uh, internal organs are bathed in the in the hemolymph of the blood, and that's how they get the uh, nutrients. Uh, picks up the new nutrients from the midgut, towards trans, uh, transports them back through the circulatory system. Respiratory. They don't have lungs. They don't like that. It's a direct gas exchange. They have trachea. And one of the th problems that we will talk about probably is tracheal mites. Used to be a lot of trouble with tracheal mites, not so much anymore. But they basically, what they do, they just, the mites get in here and they clog everything up so there's no uh, movement of carbon dioxide out and oxygen in. Uh, internal organs are connected to the exterior with these tracheal tubes and it's a diffusion of air. Now then, if you've ever watched Goliath, or not Goliath, but Godzilla and Mothra fight, Mothra's too big because this uh, system here limits the overall body size. So you don't have to worry about Mothra. Now Godzilla may be but not no, God, Godzilla's too big too because uh, his skin would be so heavy he wouldn't be able to move. Yeah. 
when they do the math on it? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> well, they're not real. Okay. The nervous system, uh, brain up here, and then there are ganglia down through here, and then the nerve fibers that, that spread out. Uh, there are no nerves in the wings. Okay, so I know like uh, uh, Dale will clip either the left wing or the right wing, depending on what year that queen is put in his hive. I don't know what he uses, but... Even on the right, out on the left. Yeah, and so, you know, the clipping that wing does not cause any problems. There's no, there's no pain involved there. And the ganglia, they can, they're just nerve centers, if you will, and they can function independently or be overridden by the, by the brain. And so they just, that's basically it on the internal anatomy. I don't know. Like I said, I know when I took the, my new beekeepers class, they went through some of this. They went through some of this. So uh, I know the books that we have, and I, I do not have your current book. I don't know if they go into any of the anatomy of the bee other than the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Yeah. Well, you so. know, when we went through the first class, I don't remember it being that detailed. No, it wasn't that detailed. No, I liked it. Yeah. Dale's. Dale's dad taught it, yes, and <laughs> Dale learned from his dad, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, PowerPoint to Dale is uh, a colored pen. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we, can, we, we all like to talk to, talk about Dale and his lack of technological he whatever. He discovered, he discovered the, the yeah. He just got on Facebook, and he just got a cell phone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Smart he, he, he tells a story of how he found out there were two cameras on his phone. On his phone, one on the front and one on the back. So, okay. So all the anatomy stuff in the book starts on page 24. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize I had it. It's in all in there. Okay. I need to Okay. So let's get into the life cycle. This little slide is one that Dr. Kilmer had, and it's. And the, the complete metamorphosis, and we're all probably familiar with butterflies. They go the egg, the larva, and then a pupa, and then there's the adult. Right. Honeybee, it's the same thing. Okay. Uh, they undergo bees undergo a complete metamorphosis. The larval form looks different from the adult, and uh, the final development occurs in a sealed pupa, like right here. Uh, typically, only the adults have wings and functioning reproductive organs. We're gonna, kind of going to take this off. Of the, the queen mating begins with the virgin queen taking a mating flight. Uh, each queen takes one mating flight, uh, possibly two, depending on how well she was mated on the first floor. So typically it's just one, and then spends the rest of her life in the hive laying eggs. The exception of that is if the hive were to swarm. When a hive swarms, that's the reproduction of a hive, of the, of the superorganism, and the old queen leaves with about 50 to 60 percent of the bees to form a new colony. Uh, virgin queens fly to a drone congregation area, and these sites can contain hundreds to a thousand male bees. I always liken it to, uh, I'll show my age watching some of the movies in the 50s where all the guys are hanging out on the corner watching the girls go by. Well, that's kind of what, that's kind of the way it is here too. Uh, they say it's unclear as to what actually serves as a drone congregation area, usually located in an open area without trees or hills, can be over land or water, and they will now uh, abbreviate it 
DCA, and your public seat and your booth is DCA also. Uh, anywhere from 5 to 35 meters above ground. That's 15 to what, about 100 foot up. And it can measure from 30 to 200 meters across. Typically wider at the base than it is at the top, so it's in uh, up down, it's a kind of a triangular. It said they can contain up to 30,000 drones. I don't know where they came up with that number, but I'm not. Someone said out to I'm not, I'm, I haven't gone out to count, so. Some <laughs> poor graduate students figured it out. <laughs> it's some of that new math, I'm sure. Of course, some of you are probably, your new math is the only math you've ever known. So. Uh, <laughs> A receptive queen enters the DCA, then a group of drones will begin following her, <coughs> attracted by the scent of her pheromones. The bees have large, larger compound eyes, and it's better for seeing the queen. Uh, mating takes approximately three to five seconds, and I don't know how they came up with that. <laughs> I'm not into bee porno, so I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and the queen can mate up to 20 drones over the course of a few minutes. Uh, mating is just limited to that site. Once she flies out of the DCA, the drones won't follow her anymore. Yeah, I know how they figured that out. They, I've, I've seen the film. They put a queen on a string. On a little pole and it goes around. Yeah, and that's. I think that's yeah. what. I think that's what this is. And they get that sl in a slow motion camera. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take the huh? After the queen returns to the hive, and within a couple of days, she'll start laying eggs. Uh, they're about two millimeters, a little less than two millimeters in length. They look like a small piece of rice. Mm -hmm. They should be standing straight up when she lays them in the cell. Um, these cells have been cleaned out and they're ready for, uh, she won't lay in just any cell, but they will be prepared. Uh, the cell size indicates the sort of egg. And that's where we talked about uh, a little bit larger cell and the other bees have made this cell a little larger. That's where she'll put an unfertilized egg and that's where we'll have a drone. Those are usually towards the outside of the Right. Yes. Bee, bee bread or bee, whatever you call it. Ground filling. The the ground filling is that in there when she lays the eggs? No. no. No, it's not. These cells will be completely empty. Okay. She'll lay an egg in it. Then the the house bees, some of the other the younger worker bees will start feeding. Well, after three days, they'll uh, the egg hatches and they will start feeding the larvae. So that's when they put the uh, brown. They won't put. I don't know how much bee bread they put in there. It's, I think they eat the bee bread and then it helps them make the royal jelly. And then after three days, the worker jelly. Yeah. So it, it's a it's it's a a liquid. I'll call it just a liquid. I know I see that when I open my eyes up, and that's why I was asking because that's yeah the bee I bread in the hive. That's just that's where they're storing it. When they need the protein, then they'll go and eat it. Uh, and protein when they're raising brood is when they need protein. Well, I mean, it looks you look at it, it's like clear liquid in there, and then you'll see some eggs down the very bottom sometimes. Well, that's probably just the. Uh, uh, what they're feeding. It's a, royal jelly. It could be the royal jelly or the worker jelly. Okay. I was just wondering because yeah. I was curious about that. Okay. And learn how to spot eggs. It's easier than spotting queens. Yes. So I like when you're new. I've seen a couple of eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. 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 some of the rest of it. I'm sure that's camera. If you see eggs, you know a queen has been there in the last three days. Mm -hmm. This is kind of back, but remember, all the, there's that many drones. So they're not all of one, I'll say, race. They're not, they're all mixed up. That's right. right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when that queen, when she mates, number one, she's not going to mate with any drone from her colony. Uh, so 
if you've got a drone congregation area, there could be Carnolian drones there, Russian, Saskatrass, there could be Mutt, you know, any sign. So why are they not all Mutt's? I mean, unless they happen to be the same thing that <laughs> she is. They will, the, mate, they will mate at different altitudes, they found, but that's not always a guarantee. Yeah. I mean. The, when, she, when a queen mates with 12 to 20 different drones, it's, they, you'll read some literature and see some people that are trying to breed bees that are mite, that we're all mite tolerant. There's just so much wiggle room, if you will, there. It's with that meeting, mating with that many different drones and the different uh, genetic material. But when we buy our bees and we're saying, well, this is Italians and this is this and this. Yes. It, and probably they aren't. I mean, yes, no, they, prob they, they are probably. because they, they have are. set up. They have set up drone congregation areas of their own that their bees go to, and they are all Russians or they're Italians or they're Carnolians. These are the bee breeders. Yeah. Okay. One of two things. The, the bee breeders do one of two things when they promise a race. Either they do just like he said, and, and Dale Foley does this too. He tries to saturate an area mm -hmm. with his bees. He'll give all the beekeepers in his area queens, and they think he's so generous. But he's giving his genetics out in the area, yeah. and the big breeders will do this, but they also will do instrumental insemination too. Artificial. So, well, I mean, they, so they call it instrumental. Yeah, he sent me videos this. and freaked me out. Yeah, it freaked her <laughs> out. But you can take drones from a race of bees, mix all that semen together, because you don't want to use just one drone, and then you can guarantee you have that race of bees. So the breeders aren't scamming you, is what I'm telling you. They have mechanisms to know that they are showing you that. They have those isolated areas. They know we have saturated this area with Russian drones. And they have thousands of hives. Yes. They can do this. They, they can be can only fly in the like five mile radius, so like she's she's not gonna fly that far. So you just think of like what bees, what other beekeepers are in my area within like a couple of miles of me, and then those are you think of those the people that those are the bees that maybe my your queen would breed with. So mine are gonna be months. Well, it depends on who's near you. Well, it depends, it depends on, on who's you there. your queen. I mean, if you breed your queen yourself, then yeah. Well, but if you buy a queen, then but that would be more a, a more guarantee. Well, she's not going to be with the ones that she's living with. So wherever she was already bred before you got right. Yeah. Yes. If you buy oh, a queen, there are you already, buy a queen, she's already, already bred. bred. Yeah. She doesn't fly out. So she's already done her mating flight. Otherwise, they can't guarantee what it is. She would be, they'd be giving you a virgin queen. So if somebody says, I got a virgin queen for sale, that means she still has to fly out and get bred. But if it's a mated queen, and that's what they're selling you for the $30, it's okay. a mated queen. Yeah. Oh, wow. well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. Because you, <laughs> a, a you would be really mad if you paid that much money you and she didn't. You'll, you'll pay 5 or $10 for them. Yeah. Is there any guarantee that that queen can come back to that hive? That she nope. Left? So I mean, <laughs> let's okay. Let's let's. You plan on that? <laughs> you bought you bought a new this year, and they're, we're just going to say they were Russian. Okay. Now that queen, she has mated with Russian drones. Okay. So every bee in that hive that comes from her is going to be Russian, male, female. They're all going to be Russian. Now they come next spring, they build up, and that hive swarms. Well, that queen, who's, we'll just call her 100% Russian, and about half or a little over the colony is going to leave. That leaves a virgin queen there. Now then, she's going to go out to a local drone congregation area out there with maybe some, some Russians, Carnolians, uh, Italian, anything and everything. And there's no guarantee at that point in time. That will be a mutt. Those bees will be a mutt. So then, should you do kind of keep an eye? I mean, the minute that they swarm, you should do away with the queen cells and then buy no, you, another. No, if they swarm, you want they need to be you, able to make a queen. 
you, you, could, you, could, could, you could do you could do that. The problem is uh, the the possible availability of a, a new Russian queen to put in place. Uh, it, it's a timing thing. Uh, typically, they will swarm prior to that virgin queen hatching out, but there's no guarantee of it. And in fact, there can be instances where mama queen and virgin queen, daughter queen, are occupying the same hive for a whole while. So, virgin queen's a little harder to see. They're smaller. They can fly. They can fly. But in, in your situation, if they swarm, I would just let your queen mate, don't worry about buying another one, unless she comes back and she has some undesirable trait like your colony is suddenly very defensive or something, and then you might want to swap her out. But in the meantime, with one or two colonies, just trust the process and let them do what they're going to do. Okay, so if they swarm, you think they would go to my new box? No, not necessarily. Yeah, not you can set up swarm traps and try that, but they might end up in one of the trees over by your pond, too. Yeah. Or well, they may, may go to the neighbor's But you can do things to prevent swarming. You can, yeah. you can divide, you can make split, split. split. you can make splits. Um, you know, you expand the hive, make it bigger so it's got some more space. I think when it's time to split. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about population, time of year. How much food they have stores. How much food they have stores. Um, so they you know you got a, a hive that most of us are not going to be real familiar in too. Well, I split mine. Bless his heart, he came over. No, you didn't. And he put them back. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't actually split them. You just moved some worker bees into another box. Oh. <laughs> they were never going to make a queen in there. Oh. They they could not. Because um, they didn't have a queen to make. They have to have eggs to make a queen. Yeah. yeah. But how do we know that they weren't? There wasn't any eggs in what I moved. Because they were all frames with food in it. Okay. They, they, they were, you, you took the ones from like the far end where they were storing all their food and yes. put them into another box. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a split like that, there needs to be eggs. Then they figure out they're queenless. Then they'll make a queen, but you didn't have any eggs in there. That's why I put them all back. I, I put their food back. Are you, are you going to do two uh, No, I mean, not right now. I mean, you keep one top hive and then do one of the, like the rest of them? No. <laughs> no. She's just not doing one. I like my top hive. Well, I know. I think it's cool. So, if, with what you're doing, with uh -huh. your top bar hive and all that, uh -huh. there is nothing wrong with just letting them swarm, make their own queen. You don't necessarily have to worry about making a split. Making splits is for people who want to keep all their bees in their yard, expand the number of beehives, and collect all the honey they can. You're keeping your bees because you love them and you like to look at them. You get a little bit of honey, yes. and they're fun. So if they swarm and go, that's okay. It's all about what your goals are. Right. Your goal is to have your bees that you love living in that box, right. and they can swarm, and they'll make another queen, and you'll still have your bees, and you'll still be happy. That's. <laughs> and we we had a discussion about yep. swarming spreads out to genetics. Mm -hmm. Letting some go out there and swarm mm -hmm. helps make other bees out there for genetics. Yeah, yeah, and you'll spread your good genetics to your neighbors. <laughs> okay. There you go. Now, <laughs> continue on here. Worker cells. These are the worker cells. But down here is a drone cell. The drones are larger. I, to me, drone cells look like the little twenty-two cartridges in them. That's what they look like. Mm -hmm. well, that's what they look like. And this this kind of shows the drone cells. This looks like it's probably at the bottom of the frame here. They are typically going to be around the outer edges. It, it, when you, the only time I have found drone cells interspersed in with uh, worker cells is when the queen or the hive has gone queenless. And I've got a lame worker, but that's an entirely different subject. Uh, we won't get into tonight. We'll let someone else deal with that. So, are you going to show a queen cell next? Do what? Are you going to show any queen cells? Yeah. Remember what the drone cell looks like. Okay. 
Uh, the queen can lay up to 1,500 eggs a day, more than her own body weight. And, and um, like when you're talking about worker cells and like the difference between honey, honey has kind of like that white cotton look, so you know that that's a hun those are honey, that's honey. And then the worker cells has this browner, like drier coating on top. So you have you have a coating on honey. So some people are like, is that honey? Is that you know brood? There's a color difference. Okay, so the egg has been laid three days, and it, when it was laid, it was typically a good queen. That egg's going to be pointed straight up like this. After three days, it kind of falls over and it hatches, and oops, wrong one. And then you have the larva, look like little grub worms that you dig in the garden, dig up in your garden. Okay, the uh, they're, they're snowy white, they grow quickly, they molt five times, approximately every 24 hours. Uh, they will consume under that up to 1,300 meals per day. Uh, they're fed royal jelly. All bees in the beginning are fed royal jelly, and then they're later weaned to bee bread and with honey and pollen. After five days, the bees are 1,500 times larger than their original hatch size. They go to town, okay? Uh, then the, when they get to a certain point, depending on whether it's a, a worker or a drone, they will cap the cell. Inside the cell, the the uh, larva spins a cocoon around their body just like the butterfly spins a little co uh, cocoon. Uh, and now they are considered a, a, a pupa. Uh, they go in the cocoon, they go through the uh, transformations, eyes, wings, legs develop, coloration forms, and the body hair. And this, you're going to see this little chart everywhere. And in some respects, I hate this chart. Yeah. Because to me, it is confusing. And I'll show you why. Yeah. It says here, here, they've got the dotted line right here. Yeah. The first three days, everybody's an egg. Drone, queen, worker, they're all an egg. They're all the same here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now then, the egg hatches at the point, and now in through here, it's a larva. At the point right here where it's capped, it becomes a pupa. And down here they say these are pupa. To me, there should be this line going uh, right here above the cap. And now you have a section. This section is egg, this section is larva. This section down here is pupa, and then they finally hatch or emerge. I don't know how long staring at this chart the first time I saw it and reading and trying to figure out what was going on. To me, it's misleading. Uh, it might have to do with the definition of pupa and yeah, when it's capped, When it's capped, it's a pupa. Um, characteristics of the body, determining the difference between a pupa and a pupa. Larva. When it when the larva is capped, it becomes a pupa. I don't care what it is. Are they doing it when they spin the cocoon? That could be what it is. Once it's capped, that's when they spin the cocoon inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, worker bees, they say tw up to 12 days or approximately 12 days. And if you count pupa, here's here's where that here's the worker, here's where she. Uh, is hatched or emerged, so you count back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right there where it's capped. That's where she became a pupa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Queen bees are only eight days. Drones are fourteen days. Your varroa mite, they kind of prefer the drone because there are a couple more days there for those mites to mature under that capping. 
Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the queen. Under the right condition, uh, the queen can lay eggs in specially built uh, cells. They call them queen cups. If you're going through your hive and you see one of these, don't freak out. A lot of times you may see two or three of these. They build them so they're just kind of ready. Okay? Look inside. If there's nobody inside, don't worry about it. If you can't see an egg or a larva in there, don't worry about it. Now that they will expand if the queen, when they hustle her over here to lay an egg here, here again, she's going to know this is a larger one, so it's going to be a fertilized egg. Uh, she's going to lay there, and then as the larva, pupa, matures, they're going to expand the size of that queen cell. And the queen cell, they, everyone tells you, and it, it's, it's absolutely true, it looks like a, a, a peanut shell there. I mean, you go to Logan's and they got peanuts on the on the table there in the bucket, and that's what that's what they look like. So, uh, <coughs> reasons for a queen: uh, several things can uh, trigger that. Maybe the old queen; she's just worn out. Laying 1,500 eggs a day takes a toll. I don't care who you are. Um, she may have been damaged. You may have done it, gone in and done a, an inspection and you saw the queen and when you put the frame back, damaged her somewhere or another. That's always a possibility. Uh, uh, she, uh, getting old, that's typically it. Here again, if, and I'm talking a, a 10 frame length for five, if you open it up and all 10 frames are full of bees, uh, you're probably, I would be surprised if you didn't find some of these down on the bottom of some frames. Those are swarm cells. That means that hive is getting ready to split and you better do something and you better do it quick or you're gonna lose half your bees. Would if they're just better. replacing the queen, let's say the queen is old or she's damaged somewhere or another, these are going to be up probably the middle towards maybe a little bit more to the top of the frame. They won't be down at the bottom of the frame. Now, I say that. But that is that is typical. And like we always say, none of my bees read the same books I read. So I tried reading the book on why? top of the box and they didn't read it. All summer I left the book sitting right there. Yeah. I had, a, I had a queen cell on top of a frame this year. That's interesting. Yeah, I, bet I so showed it to Dale. He said he'd never seen it yeah. before. Is there some reason why it was like the uh, super cells are, or the, the swarming queens are on the bottom and the others are in the middle? That's, that's just the way they do things. No I don't. I don't know of any. I've never seen no, any literature saying this is why they do it this way versus that way. So if the su super seed cell, they're not really going to swarm, they just going to replace the They're just replacing the queen. Okay. She's worn out, maybe so maybe she's laying, matter. she may still be laying, but maybe she's uh, depleted the uh, stored sperm in her body, so she's laying ma mainly drones. Okay. Any other questions? So that's why I went over your checking your hives that you're kind of look, looking at the pattern of your queens laying in the brood. And so like you may notice before they even develop these queen cells that she's like, she, her pattern is not as consistent. Like it may, you started off with like the entire frame with, with brood and then it might be much more spotty and then there's a kind of giving you indications that she might not be doing as well. This statement really bothers me. Drones play no role in the hive other than to be available for Well, nature. it's true. I, I know it's true, but the male <laughs> of the species, I just don't. Well, they, don't collect, they don't collect any pollen. So they don't care for the young. They don't well, do anything. Know. 
ladies. There. Think about this for a while, huh? Uh, I tell my wife I'm good at lifting heavy things and paying bills. <laughs> in my house, I pay bills. <laughs> now then, uh, drones who do not uh, die during the summer, they call it mating period, in the fall, uh, the girls may just force them right out the front door and not let them back in. I've known some young ladies that needed to do that with and you should uh, see very few the, drones right now. Do what? You should see very few drones, if any, yeah. right now. Yeah. It used to be a lot of the literature that you read said they kill all the drones. They push them all out. But that they found that is not the case. Right. They're, and they're really unless things get really, too. really tight in the in the wintertime, there can still be some a few drones that will roll the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you were to get into your hive, say like February, we had a 65 degree day and you wanted to get in your hive and look and you saw some drones, eh, don't worry about it. It could happen. Dale says so it's a sign of a very do? healthy colony. What do the drones do? Nothing. <laughs> They're just, the, the drones are there other than for mating, that's their only purpose. If they're not out flying around to mate with the queen, they're okay. eating. Eating and making a man. That's it. Okay. Typical. Uh, if the pollen supplies, the protein gets low, a lot of times the drone larvae will be cannibalized. And if it gets bad enough, even the uh, worker larvae will be cannibalized for the drone or for the protein. This is another little YouTube thing, and it it, it shows the girls forcing the guy out. So. Okay, <clears throat> I've labeled this worker and house bee because worker bees, the female bees, uh, the first couple of weeks or so, they're house bees and they have particular tasks. So uh, after one or two day old uh, worker bees, they clean out the cells and prepare them for the queen to lay an egg in. They may emerge right out of here themselves and turn right around and start cleaning it out. Or they may, sometimes they'll go and get something to eat, okay? Uh, three to 11 day old bees serve as nurse bees. They feed the developing larva. They produce royal jelly from glands on top of their head. There's some overlap here, seven to 12 days old. They may serve as a queen attendants. That means they feed the queen, they clean the queen. Um, that, and in the process of taking care of her, they acquire the pheromone that she has and they spread it through the hive. That way the whole hive, everybody's happy. Mom is okay, so everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. uh, 12 to 17 day old bees. Uh, they build wax, repair old cells. Here's where it shows these uh, wax glands underneath. They will secrete wax there, uh, the air they harden, and they're little platelets, and then they'll take them, and with the mouth parts, they will mold them and build the comb, repair comb. Uh, and it's limited to younger worker bees. Uh, temperature. 91 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit for wax production to occur. There is no wax production occurring today, guys. Or this week. <laughs> There's hardly any bees in there young enough right now to yeah, make wax. Is that food. bee temperature? That's, that's high temperature. That's, that's high temperature. That's not outside of the end. That's high temperature. Right. So. Yeah, uh, they're going to be so busy beating their wings to keep it that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, what I'm saying is they're not going to be. The wax is winning. initially curl up. Colorless and becomes opaque when it's mixed with um, pollen or propolis. Now, in your brood area, you'll notice how it turns almost black. Over a couple of years, it can turn black. Well, when they clean out that cell, they don't get everything. There, over the generations, there's a buildup of some of those cocoons that are still in there, and that's what that dark color is. And just from the bees walking on it, carrying dirt in, whatever. That's why Dylan suggests that we spray 
the other thing that does that means that cell gets a little bit smaller so maybe the bee developing in there is smaller than it would normally be normally be i made a, a solar wax melter this year mm -hmm. the extra wax is scrape off the top of your i've been saving that because it's useful for different things put it in the solar thing put it on a screen you think okay all of this is going to melt into wax this is going to be great you, know, you get a you get a wad of propolis that ends up sitting yeah. on top of your screen that yeah. you have to throw away. But you have all the no, clean you wax in the bottom. And well, no, you have the wad of it, and you can make tinctures and like, propolis has its own use too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not all wax just no. because you scraped it right. from wax. You can take uh, I've taken old wax, and uh, my wife let me have one of her old crock pots that she didn't use anymore. And I just put a little bit of water in the bottom of it, some cheesecloth, and then poured the wax in and let it melt. And when you pull it out, uh, to let it cool <coughs> down, then the wax is going to be the lightest thing, so it's going to come to the top. The water's still down here at the bottom, but on the underside of that wax, there's some pretty gunky stuff there. Okay? And that's the leavings from those uh, uh, cocoons and, and the brood. So, uh, 18 to 22 day old uh, bees perform various uh, tasks. It could be honey production, bee bread, making propolis, cleaning, maintenance of the hive, and guard duty. Uh, the the uh, gentleman that spoke at the Bee conference that we had Saturday. Uh, I've read some of his stuff, and he does. When he works his hives, he usually does not have any protective gear. Okay, <clears throat> I I don't recommend that to anybody. But he said you got to look when you open the hive up. You got to look for these guard bees. They may come up to the top, and if they're looking at you, then you need to smoke. Okay, uh, uh, I'm 71, and I kind of hard to sell I mean, if that for me to see what that bee is looking at. It's kind of it's kind of like they say, you know, is the snake poisonous? Will you look at it? It's got slanted eyes. I'm not going to get that. Close. <laughs> okay, so same same kind of difference. I have a garden. I just see eyes, and that's it. <laughs> I have. Uh, and then storage of, of the uh, pollen, that becomes your bee bread. And you can see it here, it's different colors here. It just depends on what the pollen. It can be yellow, it can be orange, it can be bright red, it can be green. You'll it just depends on where they're getting the pollen from. We have a chart that has all that on it, be able to tell you what, 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 where the pollen is coming from. It's real colorful. And then it's just met, the pollen is mixed with some honey, and here again there are those enzymes that that the bee had in their uh, honey stomach, and those are all mixed, and it keeps the pollen from spoiling. Uh, okay, another thing they might produce propolis, and propolis at this time of year. Propolis in a hive, it's very stiff, it's very hard, and when you break it, it snaps. In July, it is like that. It's a gooey mess sometimes, pulling it out. And my wife will not let me put any of my uh, bee suits or bee working clothes in her washing machine. Really? Because <laughs> propolis can come off and is then is in the lining of the tub and the washer and then when she puts her nice clothes in, guess what? You're in trouble. Gets on our so she makes it she makes me take it to the laundromat. So guys don't go to the laundromat <laughs> so I go to it. You're the one. <laughs> you, and you you show only it's two laundromat. Or no, and I think only one. The propolis <laughs> is used whoops. The propolis is used to seal cracks. I've got two hive bodies that uh, 
I wasn't able to replace them, uh, and the the wood is rotting and it's got holes in it, so I'm sure it's all covered with propolis right now. But uh, I had surgery about a month or so ago, so I can't lift over 20 pounds, and the brew box is way more than 20 pounds, so they're going to have to go through the summer. If it gets too bad, I'll wrap it with duct tape. <laughs> the handyman secret. Do they not mind the duct tape? Nope. Nope. They'll just probe it over it. Okay, some of the other things that uh, these worker, these house bees, they're still inside. Uh, mortuary bees die inside, they carry them out. They may carry out uh, dead larvae, uh, just keeping the hive clean. Uh, they also will fan. This is to get air circulation through, number one, to cool the hive or to warm the hive in, in cooler temperatures. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, bees that bring back water, they'll put it on the back of these hives and evaporation cools it. So that's one of the things. You see them out a lot of times out on the front landing board and, and they're just sitting there and they're fanning with their wings. They're getting some airflow through there. Okay, now then, I've changed it now. These are no longer house bees, 22 to 42 days. They are foragers. That means they're out bringing in nectar pollen and water. Uh, they're scout bees looking for sources. Uh, your book I'm sure talks about the waggle dance. You can actually find some YouTube things where it shows the waggle dance. Uh, they say here up to four miles. I say that's the absolute maximum that a bee will go. At, at four miles I don't know that whatever I think they have expended more energy than what they're bringing back to do. So typically, I was always told two and a half to three miles. Extreme conditions, maybe four. Any further than that, they just won't have enough energy to get back. And the bee will serve as a forager until its wings give out. And you can see old foragers and their their wings will be torn and and just, I mean, they look like they've been through the mill, and they have. Um, we've gone over this to talk about regurgitating the nectar and the enzymes. Um, when you get a frame of capped honey like that, that's a good day. And when you see those, you're happy, I tell you. Uh, kind of says can't forage in the cold months. Number one, it's too cold for them to fly. But there's nothing out there for them to forage on anyway, so. A couple of fun facts. Uh, average worker bee produces one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her lifetime. It takes 550 bees visiting two million flowers to make one pound of honey. And flying approximately 55,000 miles. Now you see why for you to get a honey crop off of your bees, it takes a lot of bees. Uh, and honey is the only food made by an insect that uh, humans eat. Uh, it has a pH of 3.5 to 4, which means it's acidic. Uh, it's hygroscopic, so it draws moisture. If you have, if you've harvested your honey and you leave it out and it's a humid day, it will pull moisture out of the air. And if you don't uh, seal it up somewhere or another, then it could actually get enough moisture in it that it would start to ferment and spoil. How long does that take to start fermenting? I really don't know. I, I, uh, I, I suspect it, there are several variables, how much moisture it takes, or what kind of bacteria are around for it to start fermenting. Um, someone, someone, that make, someone that makes me would probably know that a little bit better than I do. I, when I extract mine, 
it goes in a five gallon bucket and then I, I have lids for all of them that, and they're sealed and, until I uh, put them in jars, okay? So people who make mead cheap, they put, uh, they, they put their own uh, culture in there. Yeah, they take perfectly good honey and run it to make mead, okay. Yeah, they turn that into alcohol. Yeah. Uh, throughout history, uh, uh, honey is used was used as uh, in the medical industry. Uh, I think you'll see a lot uh, of accounts like during the First World War, uh, Army hospitals they dress wounds with honey. They still do. And do. They do. Some some places do. Yeah. It, it's a sad thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and. Uh, something was beat venom. Yeah, this is. Uh, there are some people that uh, there's kind of in, in the holistic medical realm. They beat venom. They use it therapeutic uh, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis. There are some people that they say that's great. I know it's before I became a beekeeper, before I was a member of the club. Evidently, there was some doctor in the area that wanted to be able to buy bees oh, he came from, from someone so that they could come in and they could get stung five or six times for doing the bee uh, the venom therapy. Unfortunately, there has been no scientific evidence that it does. Yeah, he's, he, used, he used to come to my house to get bees and sing himself, but it was for <coughs> correcting and the lines. Did you have bees that were alive? At that time, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and this matter of fact, I, I wanted him to come when I had those butt bass bees. This just and shows where you get stung by a bee. Here's where the stinger went in and it kind of welds up and can be red. Everybody has some kind of minor reaction to a bee sting. Oh, boss, and everybody it does, okay? Less than 2% of the population is in a serious thing where it can actually throw them into anaphylactic shock. So. I will I will give one warning in wise. Um, I freaked out and thought I was becoming really allergic to it. And it turned out I got stung on the chin and I didn't get the stinger out for a while. And, um, but then after I went and checked my bees, I got stung twice that day. And I went in and I took a shower. And then I was sitting in the, uh, after the shower, I got out and I was sitting on the couch. And all of a sudden I had hives up my arms, both my arms, down my chest. And I was like panicking and I ran to the emergency room. I thought that, you know, I was going to like, all of a sudden I was worried that my throat was going to swell up and everything. I think it was induced by the shower. So if you get stung, you might delay a hot getting a hot shower right away because it, it just basically pushed the poison through my system faster. Yeah, you want to get taken. So I mean, I literally had hives up and down my arms, but I got stung on the chin. <laughs> well, now I, and the, I like in the back. I think I got stung in the back too. So like. And that I, made me almost think that I couldn't be a beekeeper. If you're dehydrated then, and you get stung, you can have a little bit more of a reaction to it. So I if you're out working your hives in June, July, August, make sure you stay hydrated. I mean, that's just good for any number of reasons. But uh, the only time I ever got stung that I felt like I was a little lightheaded, I had been out for quite a bit of time sweating profusely, not drinking anything, and I got stung. I used lavender on mine, and they went away within a couple of days. Yeah. I yeah. got, I bought some stuff, I originally bought this stuff uh, six or seven years ago. I got into some poison ivy, and I had it all up and down my arms. And it was, at that time, it was, it sold at Walmart, uh, called Cal, Caladrill Clear. It was calamine mode yeah. version, but it's but it's clear. They've well, it's renamed nice it about two or three times since then. So while I've still got the old bottle, you won't find it on the thing. But they have something. It's the same stuff, and I keep some in the truck. And uh, if I get stung, and 
first thing I'm going to do probably is make sure I get the stinger out. Depending on what I'm doing, I can't do anything, you know, to, to do anything. I get back to the truck, I'll put a little bit of that on it, and really it takes away the sting, it reduces the swelling, and the only aftermath that I have from it is two or three days, two or three days later, I'm doing this where I got stung because it itches. Yeah, so same thing. I swell up and I itch. I, I itch and I swell up big time. See, I, I do the same so, thing and I don't put anything on there when I get stung. I, use, I just get the stinger out and keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, and, and I, usually I, that's all you can do. I got reactions to it, so I do them. But I, I, I take a Benadryl to try to stop the, the itch. I, had I was doing a cutout last spring and I got hit like 40 times in one day and I was I felt a little felt ill. A little. Felt a little ill. I, one, I went and took a break thing. and had some lunch. One thing in my hand will be out here. My my brother, uh, my grandmother yeah, saved my brother's life by like he was like two and a half years old and he mm -hmm. followed my grandfather out to the beehives when he was little. And he came running back in the house, and he's covered in bees, thing, covered in bees. And my grandma immediately took him, stuck him in the bathtub, and just covered him with vinegar, and just pulled the stingers out. And so she saved, like you know, because like when you're hitting a child, that's it's a lot more serious. And she saved life, you know, because like he could, I don't know, he didn't have a severe reaction or anything, but like that immediate vinegar pulling that out. And her thing was always put mustard on stings. You can put baking soda on too, and, and then I use that. Was, there's a lot of cortisol little treats and it creams a lot too. Okay, we kind of went through the bee cycle. We went through some of the bee anatomy. Anyone got any questions on that? I have a dumb question. Probably. You don't no, have a dumb question. There are no dumb, dumb questions. questions. Okay, when the queen goes out and she does her things with the drones, and she comes back and she never goes out again, is she? Have sperm in her for life. Yes. Oh. When she when she goes out and and uh, mates, she that uh, uh, spermatozoa or whatever it's pronounced. It's that's where all the sperm is from. All those drones is stored. She so she lives for so two or three years. It's that sperm that she was mated wow. with two years ago. Wow. I, and I have I have read that. Actually, the sperm is is in layers from individual drones in there. So, and that possibly she even somewhere or another has some control over the selection of sperm. I know this this is something I just kind of read somewhere. I've never seen it before, uh, but it's one reason why you go out and. Your colony, they're just super nice. You go out there and you pop the top and they go, hi, how are you doing? Or they just completely ignore you. And then a week later, you go back out there and they're in your face. It could be now we've got bees that have a different daddy. So, the and the defensive or aggressiveness is carried by the drum, is my understanding. So, that could be... That's another reason why through the summer the personality of your hive might change it. And it may take up to seven days for her to get bred. So she'll like fly out, get bred, come back, fly out, get bred, come back. So it could take up to seven days. It's She's typically only going to go once. And what? Because it's a, it's a, she won't go out again? No. You know uh, not one day, I meant one, like there's one mating period. And does well, it cover a couple of I'm, days? I'm, I'm saying she flies out to get mated one time. Oh. And it all takes place at that time. You have, you have, I you look at, look at it from, from days. this is, she is essential to the hive, to the, to the well-being of the hive. So anytime she's out of the hive, the hive as a whole is at risk. So she's going to go out and typically one time, all the mating is done at that time, and she comes back to minimize that. Because while she's out, she's uh, a bird could get her, uh, a dragonfly could get her, uh, she could get caught in a rainstorm. So it's designed that way to minimize that risk. Now there, I'm sure there are reasons she may go out. 
maybe more than once, but I suspect that was because the first time out, well, uh, the mating wasn't Maybe she very didn't well. find drones, too? Do what? Maybe she didn't find any drones that first time out? Or? Because, I mean, like, how do they know these She may not have found a lot of drones, but there is probably that drone congregation area. And she can smell them. So that's how she knows where to go. And they can smell her. And they can smell her. But uh, how far? Have you guys seen the drones? Five miles? Dale knows where there's a drone. I knew he was talking about that. The drones are so I was, I was talking with somebody on Saturday, they were saying these drones will usually go about a half a mile from the congregation area, and the queen will typically go about a mile. And that's one of the uh, mechanisms that also helps her not make the drone drones. She'll fly in the opposite direction that her drones are flying, but also she'll fly further than they typically will by a little bit, so she gets out of range of her own drones. It's usually a mile, maybe two at the most, but the further she goes, the greater the risk, right? Yeah. So you want to kind of minimize that risk to be able to get back. Like this summer was terrible for making queens because it rained every day. Every day. Yeah. So they're out there, they get rained on. Even if they land somewhere and kind of collect, it, they'll get lost because of the rain and the wind and you just don't have a queen. So if you have several hives, say 10 hives, is the likelihood of her connecting with one of them? One of the other hives, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if there's a, you know, the garden bees, we, we talked a little bit about them. When a bee comes in, each hive has its own unique smell. We probably can't tell the difference. Right. The bees can. So they know when a bee comes in, if they belong to that hive, and guard bees usually won't let them in. Now, guard bees, and because I'm a Baptist, I can say this, if a bee comes in and they've got pollen and food, we're gonna let them in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there's usually no, drones are notorious for drifting between uh, colonies. And there's usually a drone, they usually don't challenge a drone coming in. Any drone can usually come in. That's uh, another way they they theorize uh, that the rural mite is also uh, they prefer the drone and because the drones have this propensity to to drift between hives that would be another another way. Mm -hmm. Okay, when the queen goes out that far, how does she know there's going to be any bees up there? She can she smell them. Oh, well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and notice she has bigger eyes. You know those men that don't too, put you. So <laughs> she must be able to see somewhere between the ability of a drone and a worker because her eyes are bigger than the workers, but they're not quite as big as the drones. Are they leaving a trail? Like you say, she can smell them. Are they leaving like a trail? Cause well, depending on how windy it is. But I mean, you know, if, if you deer hunt, you know the role, how far scent that we can't smell mm -hmm. goes where other things can smell. I've, I've walked out in my pasture and when it was coming from the south and there's this little area that the deer sometimes bed in. I was 50 yards away in the middle of summer. I wasn't hunting. I was just walking out there. All of a sudden the deer just blow up and run out of there. Mm -hmm. And my, my scent had gone that far and they could smell it. That was a deer. And bees can smell better than deer can when it comes to these pheromones. Yeah, that's true of all the animals. Yeah. 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 Yeah, too close to Another little fun tidbit about bees is uh, don't eat a banana oh, when you're out with your bees because the aroma from the banana on your breath mimics the alarm pheromone that the that the guard bees let off to say, hey, we need to defend the home place. So uh, I heard a, another. Uh, beekeeper and he said he went to a yard that never had trouble with the bees but beforehand he had stopped off and had a beer and sandwich you know for lunch when he got there he said he no more walked in the yard and they were they were on him 
He said, well, it's just one of those days. Oh, and you have be, those days. There must be bad And then, and then the next, the I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said the next week, the next time in that yard, he hit there about the same time. Well, he stopped off to the, at the little bar and grill and made a sandwich and a brewski. And he hit the yard and it was the same thing. And he said it, it kind of dawned on him. The, just the, I guess the smell the of the hops the from the beer yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So they they are very sensitive to smell. Uh, one yeah. thing that happens when you get stung is they release that alarm hormone when you get stung. So if you get hit once, you can get hit another few times, and it can get pretty bad you if you don't do something away. about that. Yeah. So a lot of people will smoke where they got stung, and that kind of breaks up the smell of the pheromone. Oh, yeah. and they want to keep hitting you. And they can see different colors and stuff. And I swear, like, when I'm working at, um, at work, Jill has hives and stuff out there. And the bee suits are white. So if I wear a white ball cap, I will get smacked in the head by bees. <laughs> Not my, they don't bother me if I'm wearing my green ball cap. But if I'm wearing a white ball cap, <laughs> come out and like if I'm in the garden that's right next to the bees, they normally wouldn't bother me. But for some reason, they they get attracted to that white, and they're like, "Hey, you look like a beekeeper." <laughs> they're gonna Why come get me. White. Yeah, that's what I mean. So they they see that color and they associate that with that you're gonna rob them. They associate that with the bee suit. So like sometimes if you're going out there wearing a color that they like, if you're don't go out there dressed up real black, they might think you're a bear or something. You know, like they see colors, they associate. See, my bee suit's peach. Peach. How'd you get a peach one? I bought it peach. <laughs> it's cute. It's cute. That's they don't me. bother me. I, I have no, one wife at the house that they, they really never did bother me, but as soon as my wife would walk out the door, they were oh, buzzing around her. I bet she's a cool one. She can't and one. I said, what? Are you using for your shampoo? Mm -hmm. And she says it's supposed to be an unscented shampoo. There was something in it that, because what they went for immediately was her hair, mm -hmm. and then uh, they get in your hair and they get tangled up in your hair, yes, they and they buzz and everything, and you go kind of nuts. Yeah, and, and then you get uh, on top of your head. So uh, that that's why I got moved, but. Uh, that's it's just the one she would go out to work in her flower beds and and they yeah. would be right around her right around here and she, she made, doesn't like that for some reason. Yeah. I've made the mistake of going out and going out towards my bees after I've taken a shower and my hair might still be a little wet and they're flying all over my hair. So it's like they, they sense that water in my hair and I'm like, Oh, should we out here? If I go to get my hair cut, the guy who cuts my hair thinks that I want this product and stuff in there. And if I go anywhere near the beehives and I have this product in my hair, they're all over me. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I work in surgery and I put these hats on it. I don't put that stuff in my hair every day because it just gets screwed up. The bees love my wife more than they love me in that regard. They and and, and she dislikes being stung much more than I dislike mm -hmm. being stung. <laughs> my my son has a full beard. Yeah. He looks like he belongs in deliverance. <laughs> we'll go there. That's all my <laughs> issue. And he was helping me with my bees after my surgery. And we opened up one hive. And we're standing right there. And we both got bee suits on. And all of a sudden, I notice I'm standing there by myself. And I said, Andrew, where'd you go? And he's off about 10 foot back behind me, and he's got the veil on, and he's got this wad of beard right here, and the bees are just going for it. <laughs> and, and I'm standing right there, and they're not even bothering me. So I said, <clears throat> and, and with some of the wax, he makes some, uh, some beard wax, and I said, did you have any of that? wax in there and he says well I haven't had any in there for several days other hives we went to not a problem that one particular hive they were over there and in fact uh, we walked it, 
those hives are such that I can't drive to them in the truck. So we walk all the way back to the truck and we're completely out of sight of the bees and they're still, some of them are still hassling them. Mm -hmm. So what sets them off? And here again, it, you never know what it is and one day it may not bother them and they may change from hive to hive. They just, they're kind of, they're funny little critters. I had a hive that got really, really cranky and I walked back to the house and I know that if I go in the garage, they'll kind of get off me and then I stand in the little thing by the door and pretty much all of them are gone mm -hmm. and I can step in the house and, and they all leave. So I walk up to the house and my wife is leaving with her dog to go to obedience class and my dog comes to greet me and she sees all these bees around me and she says, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to take a picture of this. So she gets the camera out and she's getting closer to me to get take a picture. And they're not just mad at me, they're mad at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> she gets hit on the top of the head four times. My, uh, my Mastiff Munt starts getting stung because I see her biting at herself and stuff and I can't call her to me because I'm covered with bees. I'm just standing there like, huh. Oh. Yeah. It's true, you can make everybody unhappy all at once. <laughs> I can't wait to be able to, when I can open up the yard so that the dogs can get in where the bees are. So my dog sees me walk out into the garage with the bee suit on and she looks kind of wary. <laughs> she, she learned from that. Yep, the uh, beekeeper over in the Springfield area, he said, he, anytime he went out working on his farm or anything, his dog loved to ride in the pickup with him. But he said, as soon as the dog sees him put his bee suit on, the dog is back at the truck, whining to get inside the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a feeling that was my day to do that. I, I will drive, when, when I have a really grumpy hive or something I have to deal with, I will drive my truck just back to the back of my property where the bees are. And I leave the truck running with the air conditioning on as cold as it'll go with the fan wide open. And that's one way to get them off you. Get in the truck with the door open when it's really cold in there, and they don't like that. They kind of leave. And you might have one or two bees in your truck <coughs> when you're done, but they're much less cranky when it's only like 65 degrees in your truck instead of the 95 it is outside the truck. They, they really calm down quickly. Huh? Yeah. And I've also started paying attention to the sound of my bees. So there's like there's the normal buzz, mm -hmm. and then there's the intense buzz that volume increases is starting to tell you like hey we didn't like that you just like if you moved a frame or did something that they didn't like all of a sudden they go from boom, boom. <laughs> you know like there's a noise difference so if you're paying attention there's like they'll give you little warning signs that say hey you know maybe you should hurry up and get out of this box <laughs> so i'm going to strongly encourage all the new all this life cycle stuff in mind every other session going forward because it's, it doesn't stand all by itself we purposely kind of put it right here before the following sessions because this stuff applies to all these other things we talk about so don't don't forget about life cycles and what bees do and different ages and it's, it's going to apply to everything else we do we'll give you an idea of what's going on too Okay, so next month we're going to be doing equipment, uh, and I've been tasked with that, so I will bring, uh, probably won't have anything here on the, uh, on the computer, or very little, but I'll be bringing in some equipment, uh, kind of give you an idea of what it is. Hopefully between now and then, what I've got, I can get cleaned up so I don't have to scrub the floors in here. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, we'll do that. I'll, I've got... Uh, you might be able to talk to Jill or something. Yeah, you know, I only live up the street, so it's yes. easy just to throw it in the back of the truck. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't have to be put away when we're done here, it can sit out there. And I'm retired, so I... I can always put off taking it out of the truck for three or four days. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, a week, a month, whatever. My wife says Leave it there until you don't need it. But uh, so I'll have that. I'll have some 
some of the tools that I have. Uh, I, I've got some that I very seldom use. I'll bring them, let you see what they are for. They do have their purposes. Um, and uh, uh, I've got both a, a, a full suit and I've got a jacket. And then I've just got a hat with the veil too. And I use all, all of them. Although I probably have a tendency to use the, the jacket more than the full suit anymore. Um, I, I've got gloves. I have a tendency, I don't go, go barehanded, but the little nitro gloves, uh, I, I use those quite a bit. Uh, I, I found that with the leather gloves and I don't seem to have as much tactile sensation in the, my fingertips as I used to. So, uh, and the the propolis doesn't stick to nitro quite as bad as it does the leather gloves. So uh, you really can't wash off those gloves either. You no, know, you. I've got I've got two pair in the in the in the freezer right now that are are I got propolis all over them and. The intent is that when I get it out, it'll be so brittle that a lot of it'll break off. Um, so where do you get the other gloves? Not not the not the leather ones. Get them at Harbor Freight. The Does the disposable store. nitriles? Well, I don't know what nitriles are. I got from little rubber gloves. gloves. No, they're, they're like, like little rubber medical gloves. Medical exam gloves. So several years ago, we had they a couple in here. Gloves. They used, you know, the the. Uh, gloves a lot of the women use when you're washing dishes, Can you use that it? they use those and they usually have a long sleeve on them, mm -hmm. okay? So they would come up quite a ways and those are made so that you do have some tactile sensation there using them and, mm -hmm. and they love them. They said they never got stung, they're a little bit thicker. Uh, my hands are big enough, they don't make them big enough to fit me. So. My hands are small enough, they don't make them No, they, they don't make those gloves in men's sizes for their dishes. Oh, is that the excuse that why you guys don't wash dishes? So I need to get them before I get drunk. Yeah, but they, they're all too big for me. That had the little grippy things on them. Uh -huh. They're a thick glove and they have a kind of a lining. Right. And I took a pair of legs off a pair of jeans and soaked the top of them so they're about this long. Yeah. With some elastic in them. Yeah. They can sting you through denim, I can tell you. They, oh, yeah. yeah. They, I've taken Your blue right, jeans, they will sting you through I've taken it right here all over uh, the legs. Well, I don't I care what it, I don't care long. what yeah, it is I mean, unless it's uh, I mean, uh, an astronaut know. suit for working outside the space shuttle that is completely bee proof. I use this. That you can get stung with any of it. Uh, and if you're going to have bees, you, you're going to get stung. Now, just to minimize it, I mean, I'll bring my next a lot, you know, getting stung and having bees all around you, and it does take the fun out of it. But, uh, and, you know, and I, I tell people that the first time they've gone out to a beehive, I said, okay, we're going to go out here. The bees may come up and kind of swarm around you. Do not swat at them. If you get to another, just calmly walk off over that way. And then you get 30, 40 feet away, and they usually will leave you alone. I'm convinced one of the reasons I get stung so much less than my wife is, like when I'm making sugar syrup and stuff in the garage, and they kind of congregate outside the garage, or when I'm when they're cleaning out frames and stuff, and they're all in one area, and I walk by, I'm just calm and I don't pay any mind. She's kind of yeah, and she gets it more. Yeah, and I, and I'm convinced that the uh, the stress hormone from people attracts bees. Yeah, so if you stay chill, they'll stay chill. That's right. Yeah, my and husband goes. I, I've had a lot of beekeepers tell me that. They can go out to their hives, they never had any trouble, but as soon as they take another individual with them, yeah. and even though they're not doing anything, they'll have more trouble. And uh, I've had, well, my son, I use him as an example. Uh, he's gotten stung out there, and they will come in and he'll have four or five stings or something, and I won't have any. And his wife or my wife or someone said, well, why didn't you get stung, Dad? I said, because my bees know me. 
<laughs> and I think, there's a, I think there's a certain amount of truth I think, 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 think it's they, they, they do kind of know you. Yeah. And I, think I mean, so if, you're wearing, if you're wearing the same bee suit day yeah. in and day out, do worship every now and then. <laughs> but, you know, that, that's something like that becomes hive. familiar to them. So. <laughs> these suits so I, I get from that smell at other Ooh. people's hives. Yeah. Maybe I'll use that for example. I know that when my husband... The few times that my husband will actually go out there with me, he's supposed to be helping me do this, he has to smoke the bees. I don't ever smoke them. I've never smoked bees. I don't smoke my bees. I mean, what's the point? If they're really, the, I think I smoked them once this year. They were really cranky and I had to do something with one high. Yeah. But otherwise, I didn't smoke them at all. But yeah, he, that's he goes kind out of the way and I immediately am. smokes them with it before they've done anything. So, you know, and then they get agitated. Did any of you guys go to the four states beekeepers in Missouri Southern? Yes. I did. Okay.